So, uh, I would like to welcome Dr. Drew Turner, an esteemed colleague and a friend. Uh, so I will say uh, some things uh, about uh, Dr. Turner. Uh, Dr. Turner is a member of the senior professional staff at the Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Laboratory. Uh, he got his undergraduate degree in engineering physics at Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University in 2005. Uh, and then his PhD in aerospace engineering sciences in 2010 from the University of Colorado at Boulder. Uh, after getting his PhD, uh, Dr. Turner worked at uh, the University of Los Angeles with uh, uh, our Greek colleague, Vasilis Angelopoulos, and then in the space science department of the Aerospace Corporation before joining the team in the Applied Physics Laboratory. Uh, Dr. Turner contributed as an active member of the science working teams for NASA's uh, missions Themis, Van Allen Probes, and MMS. And he currently has the honor of serving as deputy uh, PI of the Athen CubeSat mission and deputy project scientist for the Interstellar Mapping and Acceleration Probe, the known as IMAP mission. Uh, his research interests, of course, uh, lie in the field of uh, space physics uh, and include particle acceleration in space plasmas, collisionless uh, shock physics, space flight instrumentation, and of course, space mission analysis and design. He's author uh, and co author of uh, over 200 uh, peer reviewed journal publications and uh, is a fellow of the American uh, Geophysical Union. So today, Dr. Turner uh, will talk uh, about particle acceleration in astrophysical plasmas and especially uh, the radiation belts uh, of the Earth and collisionless uh, shocks. So Drew, uh, the floor is yours. Christos, thanks so much. And uh, Maria and everyone there, thank you for the invitation and the ability to present to you today. Uh, I'm honored and very happy uh, to be sharing some research. So this talk is going to be pretty top level overall. Um, I probably have two, two presentations worth of material here covering planetary radiation belt systems and collisionless shocks. Um, I'll try and get through both topics, at least uh, uh, peripherally with at least the one, but um, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to presenting this to you from more of an, um, a bridge perspective between in situ heliophysics and what, what we're doing in uh, NASA's heliophysics science division um, in the context of bridging over into the astrophysical re regime. Uh, so that's the intention here and we'll see how we do. And also uh, I love that it's May 4th. So any Star Wars fans out there, may the 4th be with you. All right. So first um, discussing the ubiquity of space plasmas. I, I think I'm preaching to the choir here. I don't need to distress this too much at all, but uh, collisionless plasmas in the space environment make up the vast majority of the universe. Um, everything from the intergalactic medium uh, right down into astrospheres and planetary space environment systems, um, collisionless plasmas are relevant to many um, of those regimes. And some of the details that I'll be talking about today concerning radiation belt systems generally and collisionless shocks. I, uh, again, generally apply at a number of different scales here, as I'll allude to um, in, the, in the talk today. Uh, so this is just stressing the relevance. Now, this is, this is the interesting part, and this gets back to that bridge aspect. So the, the sun, our own star, and the heliosphere, which is our own astrosphere, give us the ability to study the collisionless plasmas in space with a variety of natural laboratories uh, embedded throughout the solar system that we can take spacecraft and actually send in situ instrumentation into and these in situ observatories into, which is unlike anywhere else in the universe, right? Um, it's, it's physically impossible for us given the current technological limitations to send in situ instrumentation to other astrophysical systems. So right now what we should be doing, and I think we're doing um, effectively, though it would be great to do it with a bit more budget, is studying uh, our star, the sun, and the heliosphere, this astrosphere, and each of the planetary environments embedded within it. 
um, in, in great detail since this, this is the only place so far in the universe that we have this ability to do so with in situ instrumentation and observatories. I, and just as point of reference here, um, I'll be focusing this talk on largely what we know about the, the sun, the heliosphere, and our uh, uh, different planetary environments from the perspective of, again, radiation belts and collisionless shocks. Um, but I will try to draw some um, relationships and, and possibilities for how our understanding from what we know here might extend into other systems throughout the cosmos. Right. So the, the theme of the talk is really particle acceleration and collisionless space plasmas. And the, the two places I'll focus on that, like I said, are planetary radiation belts and in particular relativistic electron acceleration, um, where I'll dive into uh, our system here at Earth um, with a brief introduction to some of the physics in the system. And then, like I said, very top level introduction to just uh, kind of the state of the art in, in knowledge and understanding of how relativistic electrons are being accelerated within Earth's magnetospheric system. And then applying um, what we know to Jupiter and Uranus in particular, and you'll understand why in a second I focus on those two planets, talking about some comparisons and also contrasting uh, 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 similarities and differences between those, those systems with, with uh, respect to Earth. And then looking at particle acceleration and collisionless shocks, um, in particular with uh, um, uh, in the context of cosmic ray acceleration, um, starting again with what we know at Earth's bow shock and then moving into interplanetary shocks and heliospheric shocks um, before extrapolating, of course, out into the astrophysical regime. So starting with radiation belt systems, um, for those of you unfamiliar uh, with, with particle trapping in a dipole-like magnetic field, what I'm showing over here is a 10 mega electron volt MeV proton that's been put into an Earth-like dipole field at an L shell or equatorial distance of the, the magnetic equator of four Earth radii. And what you're seeing here with this test particle simulation um, are the three characteristic motions of a trapped particle in a dipole-like magnetic field. Um, those three characteristic motions uh, result from, of course, just the Lorentz force uh, acting on the particle um, in this magnetic field configuration. And what you get is gyration of the particle around field lines, which is the smallest of the motions that you're seeing here. I'm going to replay this. Um, you get bounce motion between uh, mirror points in the system. That's what you're seeing with that bounce motion there. And then you're, you're also getting this gradient and curvature drift around the system, which is a re result of finite gyro radius effects and uh, forces on the particle in the converging field with the, the dipole configuration, as well as the, the gradient field um, uh, in the, the dipole configuration. Again, the fact that you have a stronger field closer to the planet than you do further away. Now, um, like I said, this motion is dominated by the V cross B term of the Lorentz force. Uh, e fields are often negligible in um, uh, the inner magnetosphere with respect to the particles that we're discussing uh, at radiation belt energies. And by that, I mean approximately greater than uh, about 100 kilo electron volts is where those electric field um, forces in the system tend to become negligible compared to the V cross B term in the Lorentz force. What this means is these are really radiation belt particles are true test particles. Uh, one with the typical power law or exponential distributions that you have, um, there are far too few of them to significantly contribute to the self-consistency of the global electric and magnetic fields. Um, and therefore they are really at a whim to just uh, moving in those fields themselves without feeding back into them, which is very nice when you're studying them that, that uh, allows for some simplifying approximations. I've already introduced the three characteristic periodic motions. And these are really, really important because from those, you can define this set of Hamiltonian action integrals, which we call the adiabatic invariance. And these are, um, a, as an approximation, constants of motion in, the, in an ideal B field. Uh, so these remain constant so long as you don't have major variations in the fields on timescales um, comparable to or spatial scales comparable to uh, these three characteristic motions, respectively. Um, other things, I probably won't talk too much about this, but in a planetary system, 
uh, if you look at the V perpendicular to the field versus V parallel to the field, um, and those mirror point locations, which are dependent on that, uh, that ratio, um, you can define a loss cone for the atmosphere or the planet itself, if, if, even if it doesn't have an atmosphere, in which the mirror point actually moves below the planet's atmosphere or surface. Uh, and then within one bounce, your particle will actually be lost from the system. And this is a very important loss uh, um, uh, term or loss aspect. Um, if you can kick something in this pitch angle, which is alpha, uh, up into that loss cone, then you're basically effectively losing those particles very quickly from the system. Um, and finally, that just defines the pitch angle, like I said. But these, these are getting into the nitty gritty details of the science that I won't focus on a lot here. Next, and I'll, I'll rip through this pretty quickly. Uh, based on those, those adiabatic invariants, um, you can define a modified Fokker-Planck equation, uh, which basically describes diffusion, to model the evolution of particle distribution functions, F, in these radiation belt systems. And Shelton Lanzarotti wrote the textbook on this. It's a 1974 reference here. Um, this is an equation of the generalized uh, version of that Fokker-Planck equation where you have a diffusion coefficient, the ji, jj, that's the uh, adiabatic invariance or those Hamiltonian action integrals. Um, and an example of this, this is obviously in three uh, dimensions here um, for the three adiabatic invariants. An example in one dimension is shown here where L shell basically corresponds to the third adiabatic invariant. And um, what you can see is just running the simulation forward in time using a diffusion coefficient proportional to L to the 10th here. And you can think of L as just distance away from the uh, um, Earth in Earth radii units uh, along the magnetic equator. But if you start with this initial distribution, the diffusion model clearly just shows that you're smoothing out gradients in your distribution function. And that's, that's shown here over time from zero to five hours with the different colors. Um, for a standard uh, uh, configuration for the diffusion coefficient there. Um, the main thing though, is that diffusion coefficient actually represents the random kicks that you get to the particle uh, from electric fields associated with waves in the system. Um, now, when those random kicks that you get from the waves are uh, truly random in, in distribution, then they should actually average to zero and uh, your diffusion coefficient should be very small. Um, so there you'll have very slow diffusion, of course. Um, but when you get those kicks from the waves or, or wave frequencies that are resonant with the uh, corresponding particle motion, that gyro motion, bounce motion, or and or drift motion, then all of a sudden your diffusion coefficient can become very significant and rapid diffusion can occur, which is, analogous to what I'm showing here in this, uh, this simple simulation. Um, this is just the resonant resonance condition. We don't need to get into this. Uh, but that, that resonance condition is very important because now all of a sudden you can get these um, finite and quite significant diffusion coefficient terms. Now, all of this is quasi-linear diffusion theory, uh, and that has several key assumptions baked into it. First, it assumes that the waves are low amplitude and incoherence, that is, they're unstructured spectra. We know uh, for a fact that is not always necessarily true in reality. Um, and even more assumptions go into deriving the diffusion coefficients, such as Gaussian distributions and whatnot, um, which also may not necessarily be uh, accurate to reality in all conditions. And finally, that gets into where nonlinear physics and nonlinear interactions are also significant. And I, I mentioned them here just in passing, but um, these are uh, very important to consider in reality, of course, since nature is always more complicated than how we model it. Now, with that introduction, starting to look at some of the planetary magnetospheres around the system, uh, and by that I mean the solar system, um, we've been gifted with a wide variety uh, of, of magnetospheric systems, um, and each of those is a unique world, right, with its own distinct space environment. This is a great figure showing Jupiter, this is Saturn, Earth, and Mercury. These are um, meridional cross sections in the noon local time so that the sun is to the left in all of these figures uh, and midnight local time uh, frames so that you've got north and south um, uh, in the up and down directions. 
And what you can see here too is uh, these are nested in terms of scale where this entire picture of Saturn's system fits into this box at Jupiter uh, and so on and so forth going down the chain here such that Mercury is a very small scale system um, uh, as you can see as well with the size of the magnetosphere with respect to the size of the planet knowing that Mercury is very small with the exact opposite being true at Jupiter which has an enormous magnetosphere um, uh, if you look here, that's 7 million kilometers from point to point on this arrow. Um, at Earth, we're talking about only uh, 80,000 kilometers here um, uh, from point to point. So you can get a sense for the difference in the scales here at these systems. Um, now, uh, looking throughout the solar system at radiation belts in particular now, uh, we know the planets that don't have them, and those are those that are insufficiently magnetized. Um, that includes the list here on this, uh, this graphic going from Mercury, which does have a nice magnetospheric system. However, it's just too small to support uh, uh, healthy populations or trapped populations of um, relativistic electrons and energetic ions in the greater than 100 keV range. The system itself is just too small, and that gets into that that aspect of the finite gyro radius effects like I talked about before. Um, other systems, Venus and Mars, don't have magnetospheres now. Um, they have ionospheres that stand off against the solar wind. Um, so you can't even get a trapped stable distribution at those systems. Uh, Ceres, Pluto, and, and Charon, these uh, dwarf planet systems, also are insufficiently magnetized. Um, so you don't get any radiation belts at these, these worlds. But when we start looking at some of the other uh, systems in, in the solar system, we start to see radiation belts at all of them. Um, the sufficiently magnetized planets being Earth, Jupiter, Saturn, Neptune, and Uranus all have radiation belt systems. This is looking at electron intensity of, of um, uh, electrons, relativistic electrons versus energy with energy shown here in KeV on a log scale. And what you can see here are these different distribution shapes at the different systems. Um, Earth has a very, very healthy uh, relativistic electron population. By the way, this dashed line is at 1 MeV for electrons. Um, Jupiter, though, is the behemoth in the system, as I'll detail. This figure over here on the right from this Mock and Fox paper is really interesting because what it's showing is the peak 1 MeV electron intensity at each of these four worlds. I, with respect to the max plasma density within the system itself. Neptune, Saturn, and Jupiter seem to sit here in family with one another, but Uranus is notably different. It has a much stronger relativistic electron population with respect to the fact uh, that it's sitting in a very, very low or ten a very tenuous plasma environment being so far away from the sun. Um, and that, that's a major question. We don't know exactly why that is, and I'll return to that. Um, interesting aspects here is we know practically nothing about the ice giants, Uranus and Neptune. We've only ever had flybys. This is basically these two plots are the only data we have of the radiation belts at Uranus and Neptune because there's only been a single flyby from Voyager 2 at both of those worlds. Um, whereas Saturn, of course, we've had an orbiter uh, with Cassini and Jupiter has had multiple orbiters. And then of course, Earth is very heavily uh, observed. Um, so there are major outstanding questions with the two ice giants. Uh, we know nothing about the time variability of those systems. But very interestingly, these actually have strong relevance to exoplanetary systems and possible worlds outside of our solar system that have radiation belts. So jumping in first at Earth, I, I've already introduced Earth's magnetospheric system. Um, and this uh, I'm going to introduce here on this slide this term of geospace. Uh, the magnetosphere, of course, is, is the volume of space around our planet where the magnetic field is um, that corresponding to the planet itself. So it's the geomagnetic uh, field. Um, and that separates us, that is our protective bubble um, around our planet, that's separating our geospace system from the solar wind and the, the magnetic fields and plasma that are tied right back to the sun. Um, this system is intimately coupled with Earth's ionosphere, the, uh, the uppermost plasma um, in, the, in the atmosphere, and the neutral atmosphere itself. And um, 
that coupling is a tremendous, it, it, it introduces some tremendously complex physics where uh, the magnetosphere and ionosphere and atmosphere system are all intimately tied with one another. And um, you can get some very uh, interesting and intriguing nonlinear effects that really complicate our understanding of the system, but make it beautiful, of course, simultaneously. Um, Right, so collectively, if, if you hear me talking about geospace, that's what I'm talking about here is Earth's magnetospheric system. Um, now, zooming in on the radiation belts, uh, this, this figure is to scale. Um, the magnetic fields are shown in white here. And what's been done here is just uh, a cross section of the radiation belts are shown um, with intensity in color, uh, red being the most intense, blue being least intense, and black obviously being essentially nothing. What we have at Earth is a two belt electron system uh, with an inner radiation belt and outer radiation belts. And there's two peaks in intensity here shown intentionally. Those are separated by the slot region, which is practically void of these relativistic electrons. Um, the ion radiation belt uh, looks comparable to this, except it doesn't have that slot region. It's most intense near the earth in the inner zone uh, and, and decays away in intensity ex exponentially as you move away from the planet. Um, the main thing though is that Radiation belts are actually the first uh, scientific discovery of the space age, um, and they've been dealing out these mysteries uh, to describe how exactly they work since since 1958, back with Explorer 1. Um, when I'm talking about radiation belt electrons in particular, I'm talking tens of keV or approximately 100 keV up to 10 MeV or more, or so order of 10 MeV electrons, um, and that applies generally to our, all the systems I'll be talking about today. This is a great figure. Uh, this shows data from the Van Allen probes spacecraft, uh, which were two satellites that were launched in 2012. And what this is, this is 1.8 mega electron volt electrons shown versus L shell, which you can think of as just radial distance and Earth radii away from the Earth um, and time over the course of the entire mission, right? So going up till the mission end here in October 2019. And what you can see here is that the electron outer radiation belt system, this is focused on the outer belt, is a highly dynamic system um, uh, showcasing an extreme variability in not only the intensity of relativistic electrons, which is shown on the color scale here, which is logarithmic. You can see how that varies in time, but also spatial location. You can see that the inner edge of the radiation belt here actually moves quite uh, an enormous amount. Um, Again, these are units of Earth radii, or 6,378 kilometers um, uh, over time. And then the outer uh, uh, boundary as well moves even beyond the apogee of the Van Allen probe's orbit here. And main point on this slide is this extreme variability in intensity and spatial location is tremendously difficult to predict and model. Uh, and that's proven to be one of the great challenges with radiation belt physics at Earth is how do you actually accurately model this? Uh, this whole picture is also energy dependent. I'm showing just one snapshot in energy here, but if you look at the different energies, this whole picture is complicated even further since the intensities and the positions vary uh, from energy to energy as well. Um, and that of course just goes right in with the complexity of the system itself. Now, what do we know about sources and acceleration of radiation belts at Earth? Well, um, main thing, and the main point of this complicated slide, which I'll walk you through, is that the sources are energy and location dependent. And the energy and location are coupled uh, in some ways because of the first adiabatic invariant and, and conservation of that. Um, but the key thing to keep in mind is that there's this energy dependence and location dependence on the sources and the acceleration mechanisms, where the lower energy population of the radiation belts at Earth, and these are electrons that I'm discussing here, um, are sourced from the plasma sheet, which is the magneto tail. That's the anti-sunward side of the magnetospheric system. This elongated stretched magneto tail, which is a nice current sheet configuration, um, uh, kind of a windsock feature uh, in this this uh, asymmetric magnetospheric system where you have a compressed day side from the uh, inflowing pressure from the solar wind, and then this elongated stretched out tail um, uh, on the, on the anti-sunward side of the system. 
So right, we know that these tens to hundreds of keV electrons are sourced from the magneto tail, that, that stretched night side part of the system. But then the greater than 500 keV or the, the really relativistic electrons um, actually uh, see their source from local acceleration um, with natural plasma waves in the heart of the radiation belt itself. Um, and that's summarized really nicely from this horn uh, nature figure where these lower energy electrons shown with this arrow here are basically injected into the system, uh, the radiation belt system from the magneto tail. Um, they then uh, not only interact with these plasma waves, but actually are also uh, responsible for generating those plasma waves, interesting, interestingly enough, um, which results in acceleration of the highest energy population of those electrons up into the MeV range, right? I, so that you have this local source of those MeV particles. And then from there, that radial diffusive process, like I showed that toy model of earlier, acts to distribute those both outwards, which is a loss process in radial distance, as well as inwards, which is a further acceleration process in radial distance. Um, and that's how we think you end up getting the radiation belt. Uh, you need this basically source of particles from the plasma sheet and the tail um, you then have to transfer some of the energy from the lower energy electrons into the higher energy electrons via um, electromagnetic chorus waves, which are Whistler mode electron uh, wave. Um, you then end up getting these uh, seed and then core populations or these hundreds of keV to MeV uh, relativistic electrons uh, in the heart of the radiation belt, which can then be further enhanced by inward radial diffusion. Um, and we have many, many, many. Uh, uh, different missions worth of observational evidence supporting this picture now at this point. So um, this alludes to the fact that the magneto tail is actually an important uh, part of the process here. And what's happening in that plasma sheet configuration in the magneto tail to actually get that, that source population of these relativistic electrons. And there, some of the most recent work has po pointed to the importance of magnetic reconnection. So you can imagine in the, the magneto tail, like I said, you get this plasma sheet configuration where you have opposing magnetic fields because of the stretched dipole uh, configuration of Earth's magnetic field. You get opposing magnetic fields separated by relatively small distances, meaning that you have an intense current sheet that forms in between those. And as you load the magneto tail by reconnection on the day side of, of Earth's magnetosphere and this driving, this constant driving by the supersonic solar wind, you can end up having uh, pinching of that current sheet and intensification to the point that it actually breaks down and reconnects. Um, when that happens, we know that you get these very intense bursts of relativistic electrons in the tail. This has been reported back as far as the 70s, where they saw greater than 500 keV uh, electrons and energetic ions uh, observed deep in the magneto tail. Um, where the lifetime of those is only a matter of minutes or so. Uh, so that means that they have to be accelerated very, very quickly and efficiently up to those energies. Um, what is accelerating them is still an unanswered question. Uh, I highlight some of the possibilities here, all of which are related to magnetic reconnection in, in the magneto tail. Um, contracting magnetic structures because of say uh, an on off or a, a time variable reconnection rate um, uh, this is essentially a Fermi process where you're, you're bouncing electrons back and forth and ions back and forth between converging magnetic structures. Um, direct trapping and acceleration and reconnection driven turbulent fields. Uh, Bob Ergen has a really nice series of papers on that. Um, and that's coming out of some of the MMS, magnetospheric multiscale uh, data. There's these kind of microscopic um, uh, looks in at the plasma itself that's highlighted here in this figure. And then finally, direct acceleration in the reconnection fields and waves themselves, um, series of papers here. Again, largely coming out of um, the most recent advances in a particle simulate, or sorry, uh, plasma simulations like Harry Arnold has shown, as well as this microscopic view, uh, this really, really nice microscopic view of the system that we have from MMS. Now what's the relevance here, <clears throat> the broader relevance? This is all important because we know that magnetic reconnection is happening at other systems as well. And we also get acceleration of relativistic electrons in those places where the reconnection is happening at these other systems too. Examples of this include the solar corona 
where you have um, reconnection of arcades uh, and, and corresponding um, solar flares, which of course are being generated by relativistic electrons interacting in the coronal plasma. Um, that is all as affiliated and associated with uh, magnetic reconnection. And of course, that rapid acceleration of relativistic electrons in the, the solar corona and those very intense fields. Um, this is also relevant to other planetary magnetospheres like Jupiter. Uh, magnetic reconnection is also occurring in the magneto disk of Jupiter um, for different reasons than at Earth, but still very interesting. And we know that you also get these uh, intense, intense populations of relativistic electrons there at Jupiter as well. And that's what I'll get into next. Um, Jupiter represents the most intense radiation belts in the solar system by far. And I'll, I'll highlight some of those details there. Uh, by several metrics, the Jovian magnetosphere is actually the solar system's most efficient particle accelerator. Um, some people will say, no, the sun is, is uh, the most efficient. And that is definitely true for many populations of particles. But um, for relativistic electrons, the sun is not at all possible or capable of generating the tens of MeV electrons that Jupiter's magnetosphere does generate, uh, let alone in the intensities um, that, that the trapped configuration of the magnetosphere allows at Jupiter. So I, the main point that I'm going to stress here is that Jupiter's radiation belts offer a very unique in-situ opportunity to understand more exotic astrophysical systems. Jupiter represents a bit of a, um, a bridge between Earth's radiation belt system and what we have here and, and understand very well here at Earth to then what we know must be happening in other astrophysical plasmas because of the synchrotron emissions that we're getting from those. Uh, Jupiter emits its own synchrotron emissions because of the greater than 50 MeV electron populations, the healthy greater than 50 MeV electron populations that it has trapped in the system there uh, very close to the planet. Um, this is just a figure from uh, Scott Bolton paper in 2002, but these synchrotron emissions correspond to these greater than 50 MeV electrons. That's a relativistic factor gamma of almost 100. And we think that those energies go up to at least 70 MeV. Uh, and we don't know what the upper limit is on that. Um, that's something that we'd like to explore. I, so this significant synchrotron emission from Jupiter puts it in the the class of astrophysical systems, uh, much more extreme radiation belt systems, which I'll get to uh, in just a second here. Now, some major mysteries is chorus acceleration happening at Jupiter, the same as it is at Earth for these relativistic electrons. We just don't know. Um, and also, it seems as though the auroral region of Jupiter is able to generate greater than one MeV electrons, which is completely unlike at Earth. So there may be additional acceleration processes that are happening within this unique system. And that's just the electrons. <clears throat> the ions also have uh, tremendously interesting and unique characteristics. The Jovian magnetosphere is able to trap um, relativistic ions uh, in the multi GeV range uh, to tens and even I think 100 GeV uh, uh, when you get into the heavier ions. Um, and it has multiple uh, populations of these heavier uh, ions um, and, and different species of ions within the system. And that has to do with the fact that EO is an active moon. It's actually emitting plasma into the system at a very high rate. It's one ton, metric ton of uh, material per second that the active moon is emitting into the magnetosphere. So there's some tremendously interesting aspects there from um, uh, a planetary perspective, especially consist, uh, considering um, astrophysical relevance. Um, I'm going to I'm actually going to skip this slide. This, this covers a lot of what I just mentioned on the last um, slide, and we can come back to this if anyone has questions. Um, the main thing is just that we have many, many questions about how particle acceleration loss and transport are happening in the Jovian system. And that's what this slide is really alluding to. And what we'd like to do, what we're proposing to do, is to fly a dedicated radiation belt mission to Jupiter uh, under the heliophysics program here um, in NASA to actually study those mysteries of uh, particle acceleration at Jupiter and in such an extreme magnetospheric environment. 
So the mission concept that we're developing in preparation for the decadal survey uh, in heliophysics here is called COMPASS, the Comprehensive Observations of Magnetospheric Particles, Acceleration, Sources, and Sinks. Um, it's been ideally instrumented. You can see the list of instruments here uh, and here to study plasma in the magnetosphere and in particular particle acceleration where our highest energy particle instrument will be going up into the uh, GEV range um, for ions and the uh, 100 MeV range for electrons and then covering right down through to the thermal populations for those um, uh, core populations of the plasma as well. We're also gonna be doing the first uh, dedicated in situ x-ray imaging in the system. So we'll actually have an x-ray imager within the magnetospheric system of, of Jupiter uh, with some ideal vantage points to look at um, the, uh, what the x-rays are actually telling us about Compton scattering within the system, particle losses to the moons, particle losses to the atmosphere, uh, which is unprecedented. We've never had that before. All of the x-ray observations we have of Jupiter, which is a bright x-ray emitter, by the way, um, come from Earth-based observatories. Uh, so you can imagine what we can do with resolution from uh, an in-situ X-ray imager. Um, and then, of course, the, the waves and fields are uh, uh, um, uh, part of the, the payload there as well. The orbit's been designed to bring us right down into the lowest L shells or, or very close to the planet itself at the magnetic equator, very low magnetic latitudes. That's what's being shown here. This is radial distance versus magnetic latitude of the orbits. Um, and we've, we've done this so that we'll get an unprecedented uh, uh, temporal resolution on all of the data sets as well as we tour the system here over the course of the, the approximately two year prime mission. Um, almost miraculously, the mission closes. We've been able to shield it sufficiently to uh, handle the intense radiation environment. And all of these instruments have been designed with that intense radiation environment in mind. So we'd love to see this go forward at some point uh, soon, hopefully. Um, this could be a really game-changing mission to study particle acceleration in magnetospheric systems, particularly, again, as a bridge between what we understand here at Earth and what we'd like to understand more about other um, exoplanetary and astrophysical systems. Um, I'll skip this quickly, just in the interest of time. Uranus is a really interesting world in itself. Um, we don't know how it has such strong radiation belts, both ion and electron radiation belts, in such a topsy-turvy tenuous system. Um, I mentioned that it's very tenuous because of how far away it sits in the in the solar system, uh, so that you can imagine the solar wind out there has very, very low density. Uh, so it does, as far as we know, it doesn't have a huge amount of mass and density to play with um, to then accelerate up to the, the uh, levels that we see in the radiation belts. But yet, the radiation belts are just as intense as what we have at Earth, um, and we don't really understand why that is. Uh, it's possible that there could be an active moon at Uranus, the same as there is at Jupiter. So you actually have mass loading of the system that could help with, with that problem. The other crazy thing about Uranus though, is that it's, its spin axis is uh, at an extreme angle with respect to the ecliptic. Um, it's basically tilted, I think by 98 degrees with respect to the ecliptic. Uh, so it's spinning on its side. And the dipole offset from that rotation axis is at 60 degrees. So it's also an extreme offset dipole uh, such that your, your whole magnetic field is basically wobbling around um, uh, uh, over time of this very quick rotation period, seven hours and 14 minutes for such a large giant system. All of that combined should make it even harder to get intense radiation belts at this world, but yet the opposite is true when we actually uh, go there. As like I said, we have one flyby from from Voyager 2, and that one flyby showed us that it has a very, very intense radiation belt system. We have no idea why. So getting back to that world would be phenomenal. All of this is relevant because there are these open questions for more exotic systems with dipole-like rapidly rotating magnetospheres, dwarf stars, pulsars, um, uh, brown dwarfs, and, and black holes and accretion disks all fall into that field, that category. And what we learned throughout the solar system can help inform us about these the more universal processes that may be active at these other systems. Um, just for point of reference, the upper energy in all of these radiation belt systems scales with the intensity of the, the magnetic field itself. And when you start to look at pulsar magnetic moments, you're looking at 10 to the eighth to 10 to the 15 times stronger magnetic field than, than Earth's. And we know from observations that you do get TEV 
tera electron volt energies coming off of pulsar systems um it would be it would be fantastic to understand exactly why uh you're getting such extreme acceleration in those systems and, and whether there are any truly universal processes for radiation belts right so now shifting over to collisionless shocks and i'll go through this i'll try and wrap this up quickly so i'm going to skip a lot of slides in this section but i'll, I'll just try and fo focus on the main points um introduction so what it, what do collisionless shocks even mean i the the, the interesting thing with a collision collisionless plasma is despite the fact that you don't have collisions between particles you still have wave particle interactions um, the particle populations themselves generate waves those waves interact with not only the gener the, the population that generated the wave but also other populations in the the multi-fluid species or the multi-plasma or population species geez multi-species populations and plasma um, and because of those wave particle interactions, you can end up uh, getting a shock wave in, in the system um, in which you're transitioning from supersonic to subsonic flow or vice versa, and you undergo a sudden shock transition um, across a very short time scale or length scale uh, where you go from a supersonic to subsonic or subsonic to supersonic flow and um, you thermalize the plasma going from one way to, to another. All of that uh, energy um, uh, conversion is achieved through waves. Uh, how exactly, we don't really know, but it is definitely through waves uh, in the plasma. Um, I'm rushing here, as you can tell, but there are multiple scales uh, uh, of interest here. The magnetohydrodynamic scales, which are the larger in the system, um, right down to the kinetic scales. And I've indicated here, so if you have downstream or shocked plasma, uh, shock transition, and then upstream or unshocked plasma, um, I'm showing the different scales here, the MHD being uh, much, much larger than the shock transition or the shock ramp, um, which is occurring at these kinetic scales, uh, ion and electron kinetic scales. Um, and I'll get into the distributions here and why it's relevant that we've got these power law tails. I'm going to skip this slide entirely. This is just basically uh, a recent paper that we had from this microscopic view from the multi-point MMS mission showing that um, these shock ramps are not at all stationary in time or space. Uh, they're continuously evolving and you end up getting this non-stationarity or reformation, basically periodic reformation of the shock front um, over time on time scales consistent with the ion gyro motion actually, uh, quite interestingly. Um, you can see that paper in AppJL if you're interested. It, uh, we dove right into the microscopic physics of the shock, uh, the shock wave itself there. Um, interesting, very interesting aspect of collisionless shocks compared to collisional shocks. In a collisional medium, the shock wave uh, basically allows no upstream information of the fact that there's a shock coming. And that's because the shock wave is essentially moving at the, the so sound speed in the, in, the, in the medium, right? It, it's moving at the fastest speed or the speed limit of the fluid itself. That's true for collisionless fluids because there's no ability for anything in the fluid being collisional. There's no ability for anything in the fluid to outpace or outrun the shock wave itself, right? So you get this super sudden transition from supersonic to subsonic flow because the information is not able to outrun the shock wave in the shock wave's frame of reference. And therefore, there's no upstream information, knowledge of the shock. That is not true for collisionless shocks. And the reason why is because of those superthermal tails on the particle distributions and the significance of the magnetic field geometries. Key things here, uh, the, the field geometries with respect to collisionless shock, you have an upstream field vector or orientation, which I'm indicating here with this IMF vector. And then you have the shock normal direction. The angle between those is called theta bn. And this is really important for the physics because with that geometry and the, the nature of the, um, the plasma physics, you can define a speed at which a particle can actually outrun the shock in its rest frame. 
and that speed is dependent on that angle theta bn between the shock normal and the upstream magnetic field. And what that, what that gets you is basically a very clean quasi-perpendicular regime in which that normal direction of the shock is uh, approximately perpendicular to the upstream magnetic field in which it takes almost an infinite amount of energy for the particles to outrun the shock in its rest frame. But as you rotate over and transition over into a quasi-parallel regime in which the, the normal of the shock is, is approximately parallel or, or close to parallel to the upstream field, now all of a sudden you get to energies that are only double the incident energy of, of the, the flow energy of the incident um, upstream plasma. Particles at those energies can now outrun the shock and they do. Any reflection or acceleration that you get at the shock wave can result in particles moving back into the upstream medium and interacting with it. And that's exactly why you get this ion four shock region and these ULF waves. These disturbances that we have in this hybrid simulation are from particles that have reflected at the shock, come back into the upstream because the flow in this picture, by the way, is from right to left, right? I, and they actually disturb the upstream plasma. That is a tremendously interesting aspect because you get a lot of nonlinear self-generated behavior in this ion four shock region. That's completely different than collisional shock physics. I'm gonna skip this, um, this movie mostly. So there's two types of acceleration that you get at a shock wave. There's shock drift acceleration in which um, it's a finite gyro radius effect where particles, you've got electrons in yellow and ions or protons in, in magenta there. Um, they see an electric field at the shock transition. Uh, this is a self-consistent electric field in the plasma itself. And um, depending on their gyro phase, as they interact with the shock, they can actually spend quite a bit of time in that, at, um, that enhanced electric field at the shock transition uh, region and end up getting accelerated as this very, very simple test particle simulation shows. Um, these particles have obviously ended up drifting along the shock multiple times because of their incident gyro phase, and they end up getting accelerated as they uh, see that, that electric field over and over again along the shock um, transition region. So that's shock drift acceleration. Now, if I can go forward. Uh, the other one of interest is diffusive shock acceleration, DSA. So there's SDA and DSA, which is very confusing, but it's what it is. Here you actually get random bounces of particles off of wave structures on either side of a shock. Um, of course, in the shock's frame, these waves are all moving with respect to the particles. And you can get uh, energy gain with each interaction because of the relative motion between the particles and the waves in the shock frame. It's analogous to you know, that classic physics problem of throwing a, a ball off of a moving wall, how when the, the, the ball reflects off the wall, it's actually gained energy from the moving wall. Um, and it's a conservation of energy and momentum aspect in the relevant reference frames, right? Uh, entirely analogous to what we're talking about here. And then there's just the two different types of, of this Fermi acceleration or the diffusive shock acceleration. The first order in which you're guaranteed these head-on collisions between the particle and the waves. Um, and then the uh, second order, which is random collisions between the particles and the reflecting surfaces or the uh, what we're calling the waves, uh, which basically just get you these different spectra, um, this being the most intense, this being less intense. Um, main aspect though with respect to shock physics is this entirely pulls in nonlinear uh, mechanics here. Uh, again, those reflected superthermals are actually responsible for generating the upstream wave fields or many of those upstream wave fields um, at those quasi parallel shocks. And uh, those waves can become and do become um, nonlinear in terms of amplification. Uh, you can get amplifications up so that the wave field is actually exceeding the background magnetic field. Uh, and then at some point, you can actually enter a regime in which the accelerated particles modify the shock wave itself that was responsible for producing them in the first place. All of this is tremendously interesting nonlinear feedback and mechanics, um, which uh, collisionless shocks give us a unique and very uh, 
wonderful and beautiful uh, laboratory to study these things. Um, I'm going to skip this just in the interest of time. I'm going to race quickly through here to the main points. This just gets into what I was just talking about with the self-generated magnetic fields. These are some beautiful simulations from Damiano Caprioli at University of Chicago, where he's interested in cosmic ray acceleration in, uh, um, at shock waves. Uh, and he also uh, understands very critically the importance between that quasi-parallel geometry in which you get a lot of these self-generated magnetic fields in the upstream versus the quasi-perpendicular in which you do not, and how in the quasi-parallel regimes, you end up getting a lot more of these reflected ions and particle acceleration because of that diffusive shock acceleration. These are just some examples from MMS um, showing a quasi-perpendicular shock and a quasi-parallel shock. These are Earth's bow shock, uh, both under similar conditions in terms of um, alphanic and fast Mach numbers. Um, what you see in the quasi-parallel, if you look down at these ion uh, energy spectra is just a huge presence of energetic ions here that are not present at all in the quasi-perpendicular. These are those reflected and accelerated particles that, that uh, make up the foreshock and can ultimately get accelerated up to quite high energies. This is a nature paper that we published in 2018. Um, it's again looking at MMS observations, but in the context of uh, ideal first order Fermi acceleration between one of these nonlinear structures that's generated in the upstream, as it converges upon the bow shock, which was responsible for generating it, you end up getting a two shock shock converging system, which is ideal for first order Fermi acceleration. You end up getting um, very extreme uh, and exponential acceleration of the different ion species that were present in the plasma, protons, alpha particles, and then we had uh, carbon and oxygen, of course, in the solar wind. We could observe all, all of those populations and how they got accelerated over time. And what we showed is that the theory um, is entirely consistent with the observations in terms of the not only the distributions, which are shown with the dashed lines here, of the different species, but also the upper energy thresholds, which are the vertical lines here. Um, it's all consistent with classic first order Fermi acceleration between these two converging shocks. Uh, you can see the paper for more detail, but um, this just shows really how that quasi-parallel regime is ideal for very rapid acceleration of particles. Um, this is just showing those different species, the exponential energy gain over time from the observations. Um, relevance here. So when we start looking at the sun uh, and solar energetic particles in particular, these are the intense bursts of, of uh, very energetic ions and electrons coming off the sun. I already talked about the reconnection aspect, but when you do get this reconnection, you can eject a plasmoid off of the, the solar corona, um, which then ends up becoming a, an interplanetary coronal mass ejection. Those ICMEs form a shock on their upstream edge because they are expanding into the, the surrounding solar wind medium at supersonic speeds. As they do so, they generate even more of these solar energetic particles. And I think that the shock acceleration processes that we're looking at at Earth are entirely relevant and um, um, important for how you're generating these solar energetic particles at ICME shocks, as well as shocks that form within the corona itself. Uh, this is just a really nice graphic showing um, a simulation of a coronal mass ejection as it's lifting off from the, the sun uh, and the solar corona there. Um, these distributions are showing kinetic energy in MeV per nucleon and, and intensity uh, of particles for different species. You got the solar wind uh, here, high speed streams in the solar wind. Um, and then what we're talking about, these CME accelerated particles, these solar flare accelerated particles in the relevance of um, anomalous cosmic ray distributions and galactic cosmic ray distributions. Uh, so you can see that these SCPs, while they don't get up to cosmic ray energies, they are most definitely significant uh, and you can imagine as stars throughout the, the galaxy and universe are doing these similar processes, you're generating this nice seed population that can get accelerated up to the GCR energies, um, let alone the ACR aspects elsewhere. Getting into ACRs, I'm going to skip this slide almost entirely. But what we know, if you look at the heliosphere now, so I'm going to zoom way out on the system. Uh, we've got the sun in the center. From the Voyagers, Voyager 1, 
and Voyager 2, which have now both presumably left the heliosphere and they're in the interstellar medium, they crossed a termination shock, which is a reverse shock, uh, at around 80 to 90 astronomical units. Um, and what they found was that the intensity of anomalous cosmic rays, which are lower energy than galactic cosmic rays, but dominate at those lower energies in the heliosphere, those intensities peaked just outside the termination shock uh, before um, uh, the voyagers got to the heliopause or the edge of the heliosphere. Um, this, this peak, the fact that it wasn't co-located with the termination shock is an interesting aspect uh, because it implies that the acceleration of these ACRs is actually remote to the termination shock or it maps to a different place on the termination shock, which is what I would actually argue in favor of. Um, so there's some interesting mysteries here that we would like to dive into uh, uh, because this ACR acceleration um, is also relevant to, of course, seeding the cosmos for uh, uh, the particle populations that you need to get up to the GCR energies. And finally, getting into that, where and how are GCRs, galactic cosmic rays, accelerated? Um, of course, uh, shocks, collisionless shocks are happening throughout the uh, universe. Um, I've covered three different types, planetary bow shocks, interplanetary shocks for solar shocks, and the termination shock in the, in the heliosphere. Just within our heliosphere, each astrosphere will have analogous conditions to those. But then, of course, you can get into more extreme um, astrophysical shocks, with the most extreme that I'm aware of being galactic uh, uh, jet shocks and then supernova shocks. Um, and I think some of the physics that we're discussing here most definitely apply. Uh, for instance, when you look at some of these supernova remnant um, uh, images from Hubble, um, you get distinct asymmetries in the geometry of the shock remnant. And I would guess that uh, that has to do with quasi-parallel versus quasi-perpendicular um, shock geometries. Um, again, entirely relevant to what we've just been discussing. These are GCR spectra. Uh, the main thing is that um, we have these observations now from the voyagers beyond the heliosphere. Uh, the heliosphere acts as a shield um, to the lower energy cosmic rays. We now know from the voyagers um, what some of the species look like beyond the heliosphere and the interstellar medium. The main thing though is we don't have isotopic resolution and we need that to better understand where GCRs are being accelerated. Uh, what we'd like to do is fly the interstellar probe mission, um, which would be going beyond where the voyagers are now. It would be getting out to the heliosphere or the heliopause faster than um, uh, anything we've, we've done before with the only two being the, the two voyagers there. And it would be ideally instrumented to study the plasma conditions, both within the heliosphere and the heliosheath and then out into the interstellar medium itself. The voyagers were not ideally instrumented to study those plasmas. Um, and what we've done is actually targeted the, the uh, design of some of those instruments to be able to study and answer outstanding questions concerning the origins and acceleration mechanisms of the ACRs and GCRs, as well as the nature of the termination shock itself and interplanetary shocks and how they interact with uh, all of these plasmas. Ideally, we'll have both IMAP um, operational, which is doing remote sensing of the, the heliopause boundary and particle acceleration, as well as uh, interstellar probe simultaneously. That would be ideal so that we've got this um, looking out remote sensing perspective, as well as the in situ observations of the plasma. All right, and these are the conclusions. Um, I'll leave these up uh, and I'll just stop talking, but I hope I've convinced you that within our heliosphere and the local interstellar medium, we have these fantastic opportunities to study particle physics and, and collisionless shock physics that are relevant to astrophysical systems that we just have no possibility of getting into with in situ instrumentation anytime soon. And what I really hope we can do is start to work more closely together um, between heliophysicists or space plasma physicists that are that are mostly looking at uh, details within the heliosphere and astrophysicists that are looking uh, at more remote extreme systems um, to start 
figuring out where the the major overlap is on uh, on what relevant physics we can carry from what we know now of the plasmas in the heliosphere to to what we'd like to know about those um, elsewhere in the universe. So thanks everyone very much um, for your time. Thank you, Drew. This was an excellent talk, like a very broad overview <laughs> yeah. uh, with lots of interesting stuff uh, about the future as well. So we have time now for questions and I would encourage the audience just to unmute themselves or raise their hands. Many people are clapping. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> virtually. Um, okay. Uh, so if you want, you can raise your hand or you can unmute yourself and ask Drew directly. People are still clapping, so let's wait. <laughs> Okay. Ah, okay, I decided yes. I decided to ask the first question. Thank you very much. Excellent talk. And it's very, very similar stuff to, as you said, to what we are doing for extragalactic and galactic uh, sources. It's absolutely the same, especially the third acceleration. Um, I wanted to ask only, um, what are you doing for the diffusion of, uh, I mean, you saw in your nature paper that you had two socks uh, coming together and the particles crossing it, etc. How do you treat diffusion in this problem? So we actually, I mean, mm -hmm. yep. you know, go ahead. Particles go ahead. that are upstream or downstream, how they turn around. So we, um, we actually did not treat that diffusively at all. We looked at it entirely from a kinetic standpoint. Um, the approach we took with the distribution functions was uh, basically treating the whole thing as a leaky box model um, where you've got the converging magnetic walls and uh, the, the leakage basically came down to um, uh, finite gyro radius effects and gyro phase in particular, um, I, such that when particles um, were accelerated up to the point that their gyro radius was comparable to the length scale of the the converging system uh it became easier and easier and easier for them to get lost from the system itself right so it was increasingly difficult for them to get up to higher energies than the length scale of the the converging box and um that's what enabled those those really nice distribution fits that fit them the, the the data so wonderfully like uh it really surprised me actually when we got those results how well they fit um but yeah, so we didn't treat diffusion at all. What we did was just start with um, the background solar wind population, which we measured from uh, earlier in the time period. And we took those distributions and then um, basically put them through this kinetic, uh, very simple kinetic toy model, uh, knowing the length scales and the convergence times, again, from the observations, we were able to bound the problem. Um, and those shapes, those distributions popped out from that initial distribution put into that, that uh, uh, first order Fermi uh, model. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the escape time scale was set by your as every parameter, I guess, or uh... it has to do. So the escape time scale has to do entirely mm -hmm. with uh, how quickly those two are converging upon one another, right? So um, how quickly those those come together, and of course the length in between them. Mm -hmm. um, in between the two, because of this. Uh, the unique kind of configuration that you get in these quasi parallel regimes. Um, once the particles get up to a certain energy, they're essentially ballistic between the two shocks. And then they're just getting reflected, right? Um, uh, at, at each of the shocks as the two converge upon one another. The interesting thing is, is applying this. So from an astrophysical perspective in particular, uh, it will be very neat to look at how this scales with shock curvature, because with, with Earth's bow shock, it's a curved shock surface where the curvature is 
um, relevant in scale to the gyro radii of these energetic particles. And the upstream uh, disturbances, th those upstream self-generated shocks, right? Those, those large amplitude magnetic structures, um, those are also comparable scales to the particle gyro scales, right? At the highest energies. How this all changes for a more planar shock configuration and larger scale upstream um, uh, transients, we don't know. You know, that's that's unexplored territory at this point. And what I'm hypothesizing is that the limit on the particle acceleration will go up tremendously with more planar shock geometries and larger scale uh, magnetic disturbances in the upstream. Yeah. Okay. And uh, thank you. And also, you mentioned about what I mean when you talked about nonlinearities. You talked about modified shocks, which is an extremely interesting uh, subject. Did you apply any of these ideas in your, uh, or there was any not any reason for that? No. So not. Um, it's it, just it's, particle everything. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So that's that's a level of complexity we did not get into. Uh, the person that has been doing some of that work is Damiano Caprioli at University of Chicago. Um, also, from an observational standpoint, Chris Russell and his group at UCLA has done some work on interplanetary coronal mass ejections and how the, the solar energetic particles that those generate feed back and modify the shock itself. They actually end up becoming a major sink of energy in the energy budget for the shock, right? And when that happens, the shock can actually start breaking down and then it stops generating accelerated particles because you've actually tapped the shock out in a way. Um, those are the only there those are the only ones that I'm most familiar with that are making the most advances on that aspect. Um, but I think there's uh, a lot to be done there, particularly with the uh, the coronal mass ejections. I think that the SCP acceleration, plays a very important role in the, the evolution of the interplanetary shocks associated with the CMEs. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much again for your for the talk. It was very, very interesting. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for the interest too. Okay. Any questions? Maybe I can ask one uh, till I see some hands raised. Uh, no, no, no. sorry. <laughs> I can mute you if you want. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, yes, a little bit. I mean, maybe it's a naive question, but uh, I remember it from uh, Damiano's uh, simulations uh, that he found an interesting uh, result about the efficiency of acceleration in these shocks, in the quasi parallel shocks. Um, and dependence on the charge of the particles. So he found, for, I don't remember now exactly, but he found that, for example, alpha particles may be accelerated more efficiently than protons or the other way around. So I was wondering uh, if these um, results can also be applied to some of the results that you showed us about uh, the, the, cosmic, the anomalous cosmic rays or even the GCRs. And yes. If you are planning to test this with a future probe that you mentioned that you are going to measure much better the composition, so. Yes, oh, Maria, wonderful, wonderful question. Thank you. Um, so yes, absolutely. One of the key things here is we realized that the charge state of the particles was actually important in the acceleration here. Uh, you can see it's, it's coming in here. It comes in in the gyro radius, obviously, um, the Q being the charge there. Um, that was important in in where these upper energy thresholds came in and with the observations from mms we were able to actually determine that that the charge states were these higher charge states so the you know alpha particles for the helium and and uh, the higher charge states for the oxygen uh, and carbon um showing that they were indeed solar wind in origin not magnetospheric in origin um now to to follow up on your second part uh, on the future observations, yes, absolutely. So with interstellar probe, it 
became very clear when we were looking at ideal instrumentation for an interstellar probe mission that charge state knowledge would be important. And um, for some of the mid energy ranges, which go up into the, uh, uh, the lower end of the anomalous cosmic rays, we will have charge state information. Um, the trick becomes how you do that for the highest energies, how you actually tease out what the charge state is uh, from the incident particle without disturbing the charge state, right? Um, and for the highest energies, that's uh, it gets very complicated very quickly um, uh, and prohibitive from the standpoint of, of the size of the instruments that would be needed to, uh, to, to payload basically an interstellar probe mission considering mass limitations. Um, but yes, for the seed populations at least, that's the key thing. So for the ACRs, anomalous cosmic rays, and the critically the seed population that's being accelerated up to the ACR energies at the termination shock, with interstellar probe, we will have charge state information um, because we know that with the ACRs, uh, those are singly charged ions um, that are probably just pickup ions in, from the heliosphere that have been accelerated at the shock. And understanding why exactly uh, those are predominantly those singly charge, uh, charged um, uh, anomalous cosmic rays is, is definitely a point of interest. Um, so yes, and, and thank you. That was a great question. Yes, looking forward to it actually. And one me, more. Me too. <laughs> um, one more, I mean, I, because I'm not a space physicist, so I would like to just ask, how do you compute these diffusion coefficients that you mentioned at the beginning of your talk uh, for, part, for electron acceleration in the radiation beds? So what measurements are you using to infer these uh, diffusion coefficients? Yep, so we can calculate them uh, using the wave, um, the wave environments in the system itself. So if you have any knowledge of what the wave amplitudes and frequencies are, in the system, so your wave uh, power spectrum, basically mm -hmm. um, relevant again to those periodic motions, right? So it, it's it's all with respect to the the three uh, adiabatic invariants and the corresponding periodic motions in the system. Then you can directly calculate what your um, uh, diffusion coefficients are as a function of particle energy and location in the in the fields, mm -hmm. uh, and that's exactly what what we do. Um, a good example of this is from Yuri Spritz and Richard Horn, their groups, um, and looking at the, the three-dimensional uh, particle diffusion in, in Earth's radiation belts. Um, they're getting their diffusion coefficients directly from observations of relevant wave modes throughout mm -hmm. the radiation belt system. So they're looking at everything from ultra-low frequency waves, which are in the millihertz frequency range, uh, and how those affect drift periods and the drift uh, scale motion to electromagnetic ion cyclotron waves, which are in the Hertz frequency range and how those affect the bounce motion mm -hmm. and pitch angle diffusion to then the Whistler mode electrons, the electron scale Whistler mode waves and how those affect um, the, the gyro motion, right? And, and actually getting into uh, some of the acceleration, the pitch angle scattering. So momentum and, and pitch angle diffusion, um, as well as those ones are most relevant to for nonlinear interactions like phase trapping and uh, phase bunching. I see. Okay. So it, it's, if you don't have the measurements of the waves, yes. then you, you have to approximate, you have to just yes. make some approximations, yeah. Okay, thank you very much for addressing my question. Um, there is some more time if you, have a pressing question to ask to you. Maria? Yes. Can, can I ask a question now? Yes, yes, of course. Hi, Drew. Hey, how's it going? Uh, fine. Hope to see you soon in Athens. Yes. Thank yeah, you for your Athens. talk. It was very nice and very informative, interesting. So I, I guess, uh, are we still looking for this universal accelerator? What's your opinion on that? Oh, is that's the such shock a... the universal accelerator or is it not? No, no, it's not. It's not. Um, okay. So my opinion 
is there is no one universal accelerator. I, I think, based on what, what I'm seeing in, in my own studies, as well as what's emerging from the literature, is I, the universe has a number of different acceleration mechanisms that are capable of getting particles up into relativistic energy regimes and producing these, these, these power law distribution tails, right, on our uh, particle populations. Um, and all of those are happening at different places in the universe. And what we're seeing with cosmic rays, for instance, is the product of multiple different acceleration mechanisms happening in different places. And we're, we're just getting kind of um, the unfiltered, you know, the stuff coming out of the blender, so to speak. Mm -hmm. But from what we can tell, at least with the in situ observations, that some of which I highlighted, a lot more that I did not highlight here, uh, there are most definitely multiple pop or multiple acceleration mechanisms that are kind of all acting in concert, depending on where you are and what particle species you're talking about, you know, what particle population you're talking about. Um, and, you know, considering that, uh, I think what we are seeing with the, the galactic cosmic rays and the remote sensing aspect of that is really just um, the end product of many, many different things. And, and we, we need to be looking over the full energy range too. Uh, so that's one of the things with interstellar probe is getting into the lower energy population and the, the lower energy part of the pop, the, uh, those, those tails is going to be super interesting too. Yeah. Which is, which is the most important thing. I think is it because everybody, every model starts with a seed population, how the seed population is accelerated. No one's giving it done. Exactly. Well, well, and when it's coming and, then, and how, how much time needs to be, you know, present applied. And, yeah. And applied and you need, you know, sometimes yep. you need infinite space and infinite time to, to, to reach, you know, the observed energy. Ex exactly. And I'm, I'm sure too, with the, with the higher energies, you know, cause I, I've only with this talk, I've only covered up into about the, uh, tens of GeV yeah. range, a little bit higher, maybe 100 GeV for the heavier ions. Uh, and obviously the universe is capable of getting up to much, much higher energies than that. Um, you can get into the scaling aspect with the shocks, which I alluded to a little bit. And I think that's relevant here. I'm sure though, you know, I, I'm sure that there are additional acceleration processes that we're not even aware yeah. of yet because, you know, we we just don't have the ability to we haven't conceived of them yet yeah but um yeah, yeah. Uh, okay good thank you I, for your nice presentation yeah yeah i mean from just one more point on this too from the electron perspective with radiation belt systems the amazing thing and i i'm planning on writing this up soon from what we can tell the radiation belt systems in the solar system are getting, if they're if they're able to, in terms of the balance between acceleration and loss. So if we look at uh, if we look at Jupiter, Uranus, and Earth in particular, they each of those systems is getting up to the upper energy threshold based on how close to the planet you can get and finite gyro radius effects. Each of those is. So that's where you're getting into the you know 100 MeV range for electrons at Jupiter and the tens of MeV range at Earth and, and Uranus. Um, from what we're seeing with these extreme energy electron cosmic rays, so TeV electrons, which as far as we know from the astrophysics side are coming from something like a pulsar system, that would be also in line with the fact that that's the upper energy range on what that system can produce based on the, the size of the, the, the system. And if that's true, that means that whatever the acceleration processes that are happening for the electrons, if the, if the system's losses are, are, are not sufficient enough, then the system will get those electrons up to those energies, right? And that's, that's amazing, regardless, right? So regardless of what the acceleration mechanisms are, 
if the system's able to, it will get them up to those energies. And we're seeing the evidence of that. So that's that's pretty profound, I think. Um, yeah. Yeah, th that's actually a very good point. And it is, I mean, as astrophysicists, it has we have been using it like the so-called Hilles criterion. If if an accelerator can, uh, yeah, you can accelerate particles uh, without considering any losses up to the highest energy that that allows them for them to be trapped in the accelerator. So this, yeah. yeah, we have been using this. And I suppose from what you told, there is no hope in, <laughs> in understanding how ultra high energy cosmic rays are being accelerated. Oh, I, th I think there's, I think there's some hope. And I, I think there's a lot of territory for us to explore. I, I was just alluding to the fact that I, I, I don't like saying that we know everything. Um, I, I can't stand I, saying I, that. I totally agree. Yeah. So that's that's all I meant is I'm I'm sure that there are you know uh, very incredible discoveries still to be made to even broaden our horizons further. Very nice. Uh, are there any other questions or comments? I want to make a question. Mm -hmm. So Drew, excellent talk as always. Thanks, Mr. Can you go back, you, you saw the figure from uh, an upcoming work by Alex, I think. Yeah, that's been, that's been upcoming for years now. I, I've been bugging Alex to get that published. That's this one. So I wanted to ask if this uh, is some kind of uh, static view or depends on time, basically. No, so this is, you know, these are statistical results um, and I, this, so just to introduce the figure to folks, this is the first adiabatic invariant mu. This is the second adiabatic invariant K for relativistic electrons and Earth's radiation belts. And what Alex Boyd has done here is he's looking at the radial distributions, so the L shell distributions, like I'm showing here, um, of particles of electrons as a function of the first and second adiabatic invariants uh, from all events in the radiation belts at Earth from the Van Allen probes era in which the MEV population became enhanced over time on the time scale of a couple of days. Um, and what he found during those enhancement events, and this is stats from all of those, uh, which we're talking dozens, so tens to, it's probably over a hundred actually events total that went into this. Um, this is the gradient of the phase space density distribution uh, beyond a peak. Um, and what he sees is there's this mu or energy, if you want to think of it, and K or pitch angle, if you want to think of it that way, dependence on where you have positive radial gradients like this distribution here versus negative radial gradients like this part of the distribution here. And this, uh, he, what he did is draw a constant energy line on here at 500 keV, which shows approximately the transition between the positive gradients like that one and the negative gradients like that one. And the interesting thing here is this bound at a, at a few hundred keV is entirely consistent with the acceleration that you would expect to get from chorus interactions or chorus waves. Um, accelerating these electrons. And that's highlighted in this Horn 2005 paper, how that energy transition at a few hundred keV is really important. Um, did that answer your quest question, Christos, that this is actually yes, yes. a statistical view? But it's, it, importantly, it's a statistical view from all of these acceleration events, right? Like, uh, you know, each of these cases where you've had an uh, an enhancement in the intensity, right? You can see there's many of them, like I was saying, dozens, if not over a hundred here. Everywhere where you've gone uh, and enhanced the MEV population is what Alex has used to get the statistics for this. And it's just, it's super clean, right? Like um, I, I really, he needs to publish this. It's such an impactful result, I think. Basically, you you had as a threshold the, the 1.8 MeV? 
He's using for the core enhancement events, uh, you'd have to see his 2017 paper. I think he's using one MeV as the cutoff there. Pretty sure is what he calls the core population. About one MeV. So this something. KV, there it yeah. is. Yeah, yeah, there it is. Because uh, this figure is just you know from 1.8 MeV. It's just the one channel from Rept. But that's not what Alex used for this. Alex uh, used whatever he defined the core population as in that 2017 paper. Okay, now I have a second question. If we have yeah. the time. So I, I've got the time. So yeah, it's it's totally. I don't know if you can answer that now. If uh, if Alex has done that, but. If you change uh, the energy that you're looking at, so if you um, if you take in ah. mind enhancements of ultra relativistic electrons, for example, does this figure remain the, remains the same? That is a, so. One, Alex has not looked at that. I'm quite confident. And two, it's a super interesting question because as I crudely alluded to here with this picture, with the highest energies, you're actually getting those from inward diffusion, right? And conservation of the first invariant after this acceleration. Um, so this picture might change for the, the highest energies. Uh, if you're basically using the statistics from just the, the highest energy enhancement events. Um, interestingly, so I'm just thinking on the spot, I, those energies are already included on this plot, right? Because yeah. the highest energies correspond to basically out here. Um, so I don't know. I don't know how much it would change. Your stats would get worse because there's fewer of those events. It's an interesting question. I. I strongly encourage you, Christos, to reach out to Alex and, and encourage him to publish this one and then maybe um, work with him on that problem because that would be neat to take a look at that. And that goes back to what Anastasios was asking about too with the, the, you know, there's multiple acceleration mechanisms that are happening here to get us the result of the radiation belts. Um, and that inward diffusion after you've got this peak distribution, right? So the, the local acceleration gives you this peaked distribution. And then inward radial diffusion from there causes further acceleration to higher energies at the lower radial distances. Um, and and that, that picture, we, we understand it's happening, but there's, there's a lot of work to be done in Earth's radiation belts on just exactly how it's happening and what the limits are on it. And, the balance with the losses that cause the slot region, you know, there's there's a ton of work yet to be done on that aspect. Yeah, I mean, Alison James has already spoke about the two-step acceleration scenario. Uh, we had a paper a couple of years ago about that during a, a 2017 event. Uh, and now we are also preparing a, a paper on a, uh, on a CAR event, which shows basically that the, the whole procedure is much more complicated if you include the K values as well. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, that, that would be really interesting to see if it changes anything. Yep, or not. totally agreed. Yeah. Thanks, Christos. Great. I think that we enjoyed the talk and we also had a, a good amount of questions so thank you very much drew for this excellent again presentation and i hopefully we're going to see you most of us here at cosper yes and thank you all for participating and staying here and uh, we're going to meet again in two weeks from now so thank you Bye. Maria, thanks so much. Thanks, everyone. This was a, a pleasure and an honor. I look forward to seeing you in Athens. Bye. Bye. Bye, everyone. Take care. Thank you, Drew. Take care.